Uh, uh, good morning, I'm Michael Spenon, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Constantine Aliferis, although I think for many of you doesn't need introduction. Uh, Constantine uh, is a real MD, uh, he received his MD from Harvard University in Greece, and then he did a uh, master's and PhD here in intelligence systems. Uh, and then he went to Vanderbilt, uh, where he and it's a little bit subtle issue of coherency. So you cannot adopt the position that when I want to ask predictive and forecasting and diagnostic questions about my system, that I will use this model that has these predictors and this structure. And when I want to ask about what's the cause of structure and what will happen if I manipulate the system, I go to a completely separate model that has nothing to do potentially with a predictive model. I think it's globally incoherent. It could create huge confusion. It creates disbelief in real life researchers. Uh, and and uh, it does not create a unified view of the system. So I always adopted the position that ideally one would like to have an integrated causal and predictive model. And at the core of this, um, uh, like the concept of, of macro boundaries and building classifiers and pressure uh, on top of macro boundaries, and that led to our thinking about how to unify. So, of course, we did not invent the notion of the macro bracket or macro boundary or any of that. It's just like in terms of strategic architecting of how you're going to go about development techniques uh, that I wanted to make that point. Okay, so um, uh, obviously, huge, huge importance of uh, separating between what is uh, a causative and what's a non causative correlation, and the whole business of causal modeling really attempts to do just that. And um, I, I happen to be a, 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 a believer in that this notion of correlation uh, is not causation, uh, needs to be seriously challenged in, in uh, modern science. Although it's still strong, going strong in certain circles, I think it needs to be challenged on the grounds that certainly some correlations uh, are not causative, but there are correlations that are causative. The issue is how to separate the causative from the non-causative ones, and it turns out that there are very systematic procedures and frameworks to do just that. And also, a real question is whether we can infer what could be the effects of manipulations without doing the experiments, and it turns out that in certain conditions, this can be done also. And also, I think we need to keep in mind that uh, randomized experiments, which are being um, presented as the final and only arbiter of uh, true causality in empirical science are not, uh, a, a neither a complete nor a, nor a sound uh, decision criterion for causality. So you can get uh, positive findings for causality from randomized experiments that are wrong, and you can get inflated effects, and you can get also uh, false negatives. So they're neither sound nor complete as a discovery mechanism for statistical and design reasons. And this also needs to be uh, uh, recognized. And finally, they are very expensive and cumbersome and time consuming, and in some cases, unethical or otherwise impossible. So, for all of these reasons, I think that this notion of correlation or causation needs to be sound. So, let's go back to 2000. So, at that time, um, what I would call the first generation of a very important algorithmic uh, uh, advances available at the time, uh, due to the work by, by Simon in the 50s, and then Perl, and, Sp and Spiritus, and Lyman, and Sinus, and Cooper, and of course, Glazer, and, and others, and that there are um, many, and I know that I'm making some very important names and very important contributors. Um, so at the time, we had some key algorithms that allowed us to learn color models. Uh, for example, when no hidden variables existed. And that was a very important first generation, and the classic of that, based on causal probabilistic graphs, uh, was the PC algorithm uh, that has three phases once the, the skeleton discovery through uh, conditional dependence testing, and then uh, orientation of some edges through collider and white structure uh, discovery and then propagation of these orientations through uh, constraint propagation of the network. And um, so that was a very important first generation of algorithms and really set the foundation for, for a lot of work that was coming out. And of course, the Bayesian variety of that, which is uh, searching the space of models and scoring its model according to a Bayesian criterion of, of into the data and prior knowledge, was a very, very important paradigm of Bayesian 
uh, perspective, accomplishing uh, very similar goals with uh, uh, very similar, in some cases, maybe even superior quality in terms of, of results. Now, the second generation, <coughs> of course, very important generation, had to do with DNA with discovery in, in, in certain instances of the existence of hidden variables or the postulation that certain uh, apparent causal uh, relationships may, may be due to unmeasured hidden uh, confounders and to productivity parameters for that uh, RFCI analysis done. So I would call this a second generation for my purposes, at least for this presentation. And then we go to scalability, which uh, at the time was considered to be extremely hard, and some people were publishing papers saying that it's impossible, forget it, you cannot do that, the kind of thing with thousands of variables. And these people were not, not simpletons, not naive. Okay, when uh, uh, Professor Alman of famous Alvin's uh, textbook tells you that, forget it, you cannot do that, uh, people would take notice. Uh, but it turns out that that was a probably very conservative uh, view of, that was focused on the worst case rather than the average case or what you can be accommodated in many real life analytic situations. Now, in general, let's say you want to scale up some algorithm of, of that sort, how would you go about it? So these were the, the, the techniques, I think, uh, if I can summarize them correctly. Uh, one is to really look at special distributions. Okay, so you just restrict the class of distributions very heavily. And you say, I'm gonna consider only multi bed normal or I'm going to consider only single-based distributions or a number of other distributions. Uh, another one is to impose structural constraints on, for example, on connectivity and say, well, in my uh, generative uh, distribution, uh, the, the cause of process generates this data, uh, nothing has, uh, no variable has a connectivity of more than uh, k edges. Uh, that makes things much, much easier. It makes things easier computationally. It makes things easier also from the perspective of sample size and statistical power and, and so forth. Um, another one is to say um, we're not going to go about learning the full causal graph, but we're going to uh, uh, pursue a strategy of incomplete learning. So we will run discovery procedures that have the capability of, of inferring some, but not all, of the causal um, causal um, uh, relationships. Another one is to do heuristic sets and say, okay, we cannot possibly examine the, the full space, we're going to just examine some good part of the space, and hopefully our heuristics are good enough to really point us to a good direction and not miss too many good models. Another one is to uh, focus on an easier version of the problem, which is learning the skeleton or the undirected edges of the causal graph, but not to the uh, uh, harder part of this, which is to orient it correctly. And uh, another uh, couple of approaches, which were ended up being the approaches that my group um, really focused very hard on, is the local approach, which says, well, forget about learning the whole network. Let's focus on a variable or some variables of, of interest and learn the causal structure around them. And, <coughs> and, and then uh, maybe we can also piece together some of these local structures to have a, a, a bigger mosaic of, of, of uh, of relationships and, and, and local structures. And the rationale at the time was that, well, if, if you have a, a big causal graph, which is your generative uh, structure, um, the areas that will be super densely connected or the areas where the, 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 the conditional probability relationships would be very complex functions would be much harder to learn, both computationally and from the perspective of statistical inference than the areas that were sparser and simpler functions. And that there was no homogeneity in the network, but the, 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 the big network had heterogeneity, and therefore certain parts of that would be discoverable, and certain parts of it would not be discoverable. And also reflected the reality of the fact that many researchers with whom we interacted at the time, they were not interested in learning a big network about all biology, they were interested about learning a pathway of a specific molecule and what has to do with a specific disease. So it was very localized in that sense. So for this reason, we decided to really follow a local uh, approach and a local to global. Okay. And this is what I said previously about the Markov boundary, which really provides a very natural bridge between the predictive modeling world and the causal structure uh, modeling world. 
the Markov boundary is the minimal Markov blanket, meaning you cannot remove any substance of variables without losing the Markov blanket property, which is that condition of the Markov blanket, every other uh, variable that's not the Markov blanket is independent to the response variable, the target variable T here in this uh, example. And that, with a little bit of theory, uh, it gets you to the point that you can have a very nice um, uh, framework for future selection, predictivity, and, uh, and causation, all rolled in one. So, Yanni uh, Tamarino, um, a, another graduate of the Intelligent Systems Science program, and I, back in 2003, we, we wrote a, a little paper there that was trying to really describe how all of these things would work together and also uh, to, to showcase that certain uh, notions about relevance that were very prominent at the time, um, uh, particularly the definitions of relevance uh, coming from Kohan and John about uh, strongly relevant features, weakly relevant and irrelevant ones, would map very well for effective distributions the notions of the Markov boundary being the strongly variables, the strongly relevant variables. Everything that would have a path to the Markov uh, boundary would be a weakly relevant uh, feature, and everything that would not have a path would be an irrelevant. We also proved some very straightforward theoretical results about the impossibility to use upper for future selection across all possible distributions uh, in a way that would have advanced over other techniques or that. Um, uh, but there cannot be any single definition of relevancy that could cover all possible uh, loss method, loss functions, distributions, and classifiers. Uh, that that is because at the time there was a lot of misunderstanding. I think that somehow uh, filter, so-called filter feature selection, was superior than uh, rappers and so forth. So we tried to sort out, you know, a little bit of the of the landscape there at the time and, and, and create a framework that would be Markov boundary oriented for future selection and at the same time doing predictive causation. Uh, our end goal was this, that was the, the, the vision if you if you will, to create a model that allows you uh, to say, okay, this is my target here and this is what's the causal structure of this domain. So this model not only shows what is causally influencing what, but also it directly points to which of these variables are, are univariate predictors of the target, but not causally related to it, which are invariably predictors of the target and causally related, which are univariately predictive, but not uh, invariably predictive. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, which are non-predictive and non-causal. So, in, in, in essence, dissecting this issue of predictivity and causality cleanly. And furthermore, uh, easily focusing on what's the minimal set to have a, a maximally informative predictor uh, set for, for the target and also to use um, tools such as do-calculus that will allow you in many cases uh, to reliably infer what would be the effects of interventions on that system. Okay? And in order to, to reach that point, a lot of algorithms have to be developed. So, through these various <coughs> types of algorithms. So, um, at the time, uh, there were, uh, I think, two key algorithms. Um, when I say at the time, you see, just before 2000. Uh, the colors and Hami algorithm was a highly heuristic algorithm. And um, as it turns out, non-scalable unless you set, it has a parameter there that sets uh, conditioning set sizes. And unless you set it to zero, which basically makes the algorithm a univariate fil um, filter selector, okay, at, at, at k zero, it's non-scalable. So if you set it to the scalable setting, in essence, you're doing univariate filter selection. Uh, and then k2 and b, that was developed uh, by, by uh, uh, Greg, and uh, I helped him with that. And uh, that was an algorithm that was uh, a heuristic also algorithm um, uh, using K2 as its uh, foundational structure for operation, another heuristic uh, non scalable algorithm at the time. However, when we applied that algorithm uh, in the Pneumonia Port project, um, we found that it achieved a huge compression 
of, of the data. It was the most compressed, uh, high, highly predictive uh, algorithm. I mean, a, a feature set that we got out of that project. It uh, selected uh, eight features out of 220 uh, with very, very, very high predictivity. So I, I, I think I, somewhere in the back of my mind, that particular result uh, stuck and resurfaced five years later with an effort to really go after uh, algorithms uh, that would specifically target uh, finding the Markov boundary. Uh, in uh, 2000, uh, Margarita sent through at CMU at the time. Uh, they invented algorithm growth string, which was the first sound uh, Markov boundary algorithm. So the first algorithm that would directly try to find the Markov boundary and would be asymptotically uh, correct. However, it had some limitations. It was somewhat inefficient um, and, and non-scale. Okay. So, and of course, the other approach at, available at the time was to learn the full cause of graph and extract the Markov boundary from the full cause of graph, but again, that was not scalable. So that was the state of affairs back in 2000. That I would say the the, the third generation of, of albums that had localized macro boundary inference, and um, I call this uh, definitional because the growth shrink, which is the that major, I think, uh, advance at the time, uh, was applying the definition of what is a macro uh, blanket. Uh, straight in the operation of the algorithm. So it was testing the variables, applying, in essence, the definition of the Markov blanket and, and a couple of very straightforward uh, implications of that definition. Fourth generation, um, I think that uh, that happened with uh, the Young family, with the, the stats for uh, uh, iterative association Markov blanket. Um, again, in the definitional category, because this, it applies the definition of, of um, of, of the Markov blanket. Uh, it returns the Markov blanket, it's sound in favor of distributions. Um, it, it was somewhat inefficient, uh, but was very scalable because it used a, a little bit um, smarter, but uh, heuristically much more powerful, um, heuristic criteria for short field variables for inclusion in the tentative Markov uh, blanket. And there were other various versions of that that used post-processing with global algorithms because once you had um, reduced your set to a manageable small number, then you can run global algorithms to further define it in a sample more efficient way. So we coupled this uh, algorithm with uh, BC and other algorithms at the time to post-process the results. And the first paper was added in 2003. <coughs> um, and the actual Empirical results we were getting with this algorithm in terms of predictivity and compression of data was just excellent. Just uh, excellent. Uh, fifth generation was directly attempting to learn local edges around the variable of interest, so, so truly local learning. And the first two algorithms that appeared in that uh, vein was MMPC and HIDOMPC. Uh, sound and faithful distributions with non hidden variables locally, sample efficient, very, very scalable. And uh, also, as it turns out, uh, quite robust for various violations of assumptions. Uh, recently, I uh, uh, was uh, given a paper by one of your colleagues uh, uh, describing how uh, robust is, is this algorithm to feedback loops. So it just has some very minor false positives and everything else works fine, as it turns out. Um, Now, uh, these, these algorithms are quite simple, uh, as a matter of fact. They're, they're not very complicated. And of course, um, I'm not going to go into how they operate here. Um, all of this is published. You can just you know, see the papers, the tutorials, and all kinds of all descriptions. Um, but they can become slightly more complicated if you want to make them more efficient and more scalable. For example, uh, same mind that you need to see is a slightly more complicated and vastly more efficient uh, implementation because it, um, uh, at, the, at the stage of inclusion in the tentative uh, local neighborhood, it does uh, some, some uh, a, a limited number of conditional dependence tests right there at the inclusion and does not allow the tentative uh, local neighborhood to grow too much so that things become uh, computationally efficiently drawn. So that's, that's a, a 
is an example of how uh, modifications and, and uh, all, all those basic algorithms can be used. Uh, a very obvious extension of, of that iteration was to recursively apply to that k uh, uh, around a, a, a target variable of interest to create a region, not the full network, but a region of, of, of uh, local neighborhoods. So instead of uh, applying the, the, the others that will do local neighborhoods, we do go to the depth of one, so one edge away from the target. But if you keep uh, running them on the periphery of that, you can get depth two, depth three, and so forth. So very, very straightforward. Maybe there are technicalities there on how you can make this uh, work uh, well from a statistical perspective and, and how you can save some communications and so forth. But the, the conceptual uh, idea is very, very straightforward. Um, a seventh generation has to do with parallelizing, tagging, distributing, and sequen uh, doing sequential versions of, <coughs> of those algorithms. And, and the first um, algorithm that uh, family that uh, underwent that treatment was the ARM family. So uh, parallelizing has to do, let me explain what I mean by this terms. So parallelizing has to do with distributing uh, work uh, among uh, processors. Okay, so you want to find the Markov boundary in a big data set, and you say, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna split this data into many processors. I'm gonna find local Markov boundaries, and then I'm gonna merge the results, and I'm gonna process again, we split and remerge. As it turns out, you need to do it two times only for faithful distributions. And therefore, uh, parallelizing the discovery task like this by splitting your, your variables. The chunking has to do when um, uh, you, you want to do the analysis in one computer, but the data does not fit the, the fast memory. So you split in chunks, and this enter one at a time, and uh, the algorithm uh, of chunking um, goes through these chunks and produces the correct Markov boundary at the end. Uh, distributing or federated, I should say, database is when you have a naturally split database into many parts and you do local map of boundary, and then again, you use similar, very similar approaches to parallelize. But then the trick is um, how, do you, uh, how do you connect the various uh, data elements between uh, federated databases. And then the sequential version is when you do not do discovery in one, in one sitting, but rather you uh, you augment your discovery over time as, as new variables are coming in the discovery process. And this mimics how science is doing uh, uh, discovery in the sense that uh, in year one you may have 10 variables, in, in year two you may have another three, in year four you may have another 50, and so forth. And you, you want to keep improving your mark of boundary as more variables are coming in. So, uh, this algorithmic family here has, you know, is amenable to all of these uh, treatments, and uh, that would be generation seven. Now, <clears throat> so far so good, but these algorithms were not sample efficient. Why? Because you would need to, <laughs> with the exception of the local edges one, the Markov boundary algorithms, you would need to condition on at least the size of the true Markov boundary, and in most practical instances, much more. And because in uh, unconstrained distributions, the sample size you need could grow exponentially the number of variables you need the true Markov boundary, very quickly you would run out of sample. Okay, so unless your true Markov boundary was very, very small, and unless your heuristic for building the Markov boundary was smart enough to not overgrow the tenant Markov boundary to be too much larger than the true one. So an approach uh, to direct Markov boundary discovery, which I, I call compositional, and uh, I call compositional for the reason you'll understand immediately, is to build the Markov boundary one edge at a time. So instead of trying to apply the definition of the Markov boundary and condition on all variables, you try to learn edge by edge the Markov boundary. And um, this class of albums, um, uh, the first ones appeared in 2003 again, some in favor distribution, some efficient. Uh, robust values to that, some of the assumptions, again, very, very scalable and with great empirical results in terms of predictivity. 
Okay. Then uh, the next step, once we had the tools uh, to around 2003 to learn the local neighborhoods and the, to learn the, the market boundaries directly, we said, okay, let's try now to piece together the bigger network by running the local techniques on its variable in, in the distribution. And of course, a priori, someone might say, wait a minute, uh, that's totally stupid because if you say, if you tell me that PC, for example, at least the original version of PC, uh, is not scalable, okay, and uses conditional dependence testing, uh, how on earth are you gonna be scalable by doing the local discovery and then piecing it together? It should basically fall on the same constraints of, of uh, scalability. But it turns out that PC, um, it, it, it does um, a progressive increase of the conditional dependence, uh, conditional dependence uh, test conditioning size uniformly across all variables, if you look at the algorithm, okay? Whereas with the local version, you're doing it the one variable at a time. And the heuristic efficiency of doing this in terms of saving computational dependence tests is much, much larger if you do it in, in realistic distributions, obviously, if you're doing it um, uh, locally and then you piece together the pieces. Also, another factor that matters a lot, but we have not exploited into published practical algorithms, is it really matters uh, uh, the order by which you do the variables. So, <coughs> if it, one example will be published uh, in, in the Zillow paper in 2010, JMLR, so this very clearly, if you have a fun structure and say variable uh, X, is connected to with single edges to variables a sub, uh, sub, uh, sub one to a sub thousand. If you try to learn the this local structure starting from a, the efficiency and scalability is completely different than if you start from the a's, the a sub i's. So the order matters a lot, and uh, for for a variety of reasons. So uh, algorithm MMHC was the first public algorithm we did, was about 2006, that would apply uh, a local <coughs> neighborhood technique for each and every variable, and then it would post-process the results with uh, greedy search uh, using the, um, the, the, um, the framework invented by, by Greg Cooper and the metric specifically invented by, by the Heckerman uh, BDE to do orientation and repair. So the skeleton phase um, is sound in fatal distributions, assuming enough sample size, uh, but the orientation was uh, heuristic. But when we tested it, it was really, really very good compared to other uh, top algorithms of the time across many data sets, and it was very sample efficient and very scalable. Um, but this algorithm could deal only with discrete variables. So other versions of that have been messed over time that can be dealt with continuous. And the second, the tenth generation here had to do with our attempt to generalize these algorithms. I would receive over the years many, many papers that would come to me as a reviewer and they would say, oh, I have this algorithm uh, for basic NCM, but I took away step by or it's uh, an MPC, but uh, I modified step uh, 10 or something. And it was obvious to me that either they, by doing that, they would lose soundness, or by doing that, they would just uh, have another minor variation of the same algorithmic idea. So one of the goals was to, for me to try to understand, okay, what, I mean, this whole family of algorithms, what, what are the generalizable characteristics? So we set out to create general descriptions of the whole family, both for the definitional uh, Markov boundary class of techniques and for the direct local edges. And we came up with a framework which we call the generalized local learning and the local global learning that provide a, a generative algorithm, a two generative algorithms, if you will, that you can instantiate various components in a variety of ways, actually in infinity ways. And if you follow certain admissibility rules, then the end result has guaranteed properties because it comes with some, you know, very simple uh, meta proofs about the, this class of algorithms. So that was uh, good in that sense that it really clarified what should be um, 
the, 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 the way it's to instantiate and create versions of those algorithms. And, and we also created some versions that really had excellent performance but were distinct than previously derived uh, members of that family. The eleventh generation here had to do with uh, with Blisty and equivalence modeling, and uh, that would be the the, the, um, uh, the incentive for doing that was that in molecular high throughput data in particular, you see a lot of information overlap. I'm not talking about uh, collinearities; it's different. Uh, I'm talking about uh, variables or variable sets that same that share. Uh, exactly the same information about some response variable meters, for example, a clinical diagnosis or some other clinical phenotype of interest. And you could extract numerous of those sets that would uh, have the same information. They would all predict, say, diagnosis with 99% uh, AUC. And um, obviously that would cre create a host of problems in the interpretability also in the connection with the causal, with the, the causal structure and so forth, it turns out these distributions are not exactly faithful. There are violations of faithfulness that allow for this to happen because with faithful distributions you only have one Markov boundary, but there you have many Markov boundaries. So the, uh, our approach to solving that problem was to, um, to create a class of algorithms that can output all Markov boundaries. Uh, and also to try to have some versions of those that were um, more efficient. Uh, and as it turns out, the, macro, the number of macro boundaries can be exponential to the number of variables in distribution. So it's a really, really hard problem. Worst case scenario, you can never extract all of them, uh, regardless of the algorithm you're using. Uh, nevertheless, in practical situations, you can get very, very informative and, and large equivalence classes of, of macro boundaries and optimal predictors that are very useful in practice. And the algorithm that does that is, and, and by the way, you don't need determinism. As Jean Lemire showed uh, first, is you don't need the determinism to have uh, multiplicity of Markov boundaries. You also do not need collinearities. Okay, so these are different uh, orthogonal uh, aspects. And this is the <laughs> the pseudocode for the star algorithm. And if you want to really uh, and learn why this thing is very efficient, very, 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 very fast. Uh, I suggest looking at the paper that the first author is uh, Alex Danico, and, and Alex did his PhD on that algorithm, uh, where he explains the three fundamental uh, reasons why a Thai star is really so scalable. Uh, that's in uh, January 2013. Um, Another uh, generation of algorithms um, which we have not published but we have patented, and um, don't ask me why, but this is how it is, is SIMP. And uh, this deals with uh, compositional techniques for learning the apparent Markov boundary when you have hidden variables. And it turns out that the definitional algorithms are robust to the existence of hidden variables, but the, uh, the, the, the compositional ones are susceptible to false negatives. Okay, and that was a little bit unexpected, but that's how it is. And SIMP is a, is a composition uh, algorithm that learns the, co the correct apparent Markov boundary in the presence of hidden variables, although it's a compositional technique. Um, and finally, the third generation here is experimentation minimization with algorithm or DLP. I have to say that uh, the, the, the really important breakthrough in uh, minimizing experiments and showing the maximum number of experiments and so forth um, needed to discover a causal structure uh, was discovered by uh, Clark Glymore and, and his student uh, Eberhard. Um, and so this algorithm is, is a, in that general vein of research, but it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's addressing the issue of when you cannot do really do manipulations that are multiple manipulations across many variables. Uh, just so sort it of happens in, say, molecular biology uh, research. Uh, and, and it's also highly localized. So it looks only at the local pathway and the full color structure. And moreover, it allows 
for violation of faithfulness that lead to multiple macro boundaries and multiple apparent local neighborhoods. So that these are the differentiations between the, the foundational work by Everhart and Langmuir. And uh, we have a paper that's um, uh, accepted at JMLR coming out. I'm not sure if it's uploaded or not, but it should be very soon. That describes how the sound works and compares it with others. It's super highly scalable. It can go to a million levels easily. I believe Alex Andikov uh, came presentation to a CMU host conference a year ago describing early results uh, without giving the details. So if you, if you want to see the details of that, you can read uh, that paper. We have also another biological paper um, describing biological experiments and the testing of that algorithm coming up. And the whole idea of the algorithm is to um, find the effects, uh, uh, remote causes, direct causes, and passengers, meaning things that are um, that are connected to the target through uh, through causes of the target, but without them being causes, uh, in, in progressive steps of experimentation. And the algorithm recommends what would be the, experiment, the experimental steps to resolve the local uh, neighborhood the presence of these equivalence clusters that have the exact same information about the target. And, and normal local discovery techniques uh, will give you false positives and false negatives because of these equivalences. So I guess no time to really <laughs> um, present how it works. Um, and, and, and all of these albums now also have been paralyzed, time sequenced, and distributed uh, as well. Now. Let me move on to uh, dis discussing some of the of the lessons learned in my group, at least, and in my mind, about how to, to really go about discovering or, or creating and testing such algorithms. But one thing I want to say before I get to, to, to those points is that we did a whole lot of testing. Uh, when I say a whole lot, I'm not saying we, we did 10 data sets. We did. We did. Uh, Many, many, many hundreds of data sets, many uh, tens of thousands of protocols. Um, our benchmarking was just fast, and, and I will explain why is that. And I'll, I'll just uh, run through some of the application of the testing and the benchmarking really quick, just to give you the idea of the size, not the, the details. Uh, this deck is going to be distributed. You can look at the details of that and all of that. I mean, all of the benchmarking has been published. Uh, with the exception of maybe one study. But um, I want to emphasize the importance of benchmarking on a large scale. Um, so, for example, in the experiments we published in GMLR 2010, we did more than 100 algorithms and versions, more than 40 dances. Okay, and we did uh, everything by everything. So, and then with uh, fully uh, developed uh, cross validated, nest cross validated experimental designs. So it's like hugely expensive computation. And as you will see here, we also were very careful to, to showcase the full parameter space, not just to choose one parameter and say, oh, that's the magical parameter value that makes us look good, but also to show what happens with all parameters tested. That's another important element to keep us honest. And uh, in, in, in the equivalent study of that with uh, high throughput molecular data, we did. 43 data sets and tasks, and then 35 compiler albums. Uh, that's another study, single study. Then um, in another, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of those things, just to give a sense of the size of this project. Uh, so the MMHC algorithm, we compared 13 total variants, more than 20 data sets, everything again. Um, in a pathway reverse engineering study, 15 data sets, um, and 33 algorithms. Uh, in, in, the, in the sequence or multiplicity study, uh, I believe we did uh, about uh, 10 data sets and, and 8 algorithms, if I remember correctly. In the coding uh, domain where we detect categorization studies, probably the largest uh, field. Uh, 
of status with 240 data sets tasks, third classification, 23 selection of output combinations, so 600 combinations, four slot loss functions in a repeated, uh, nested repeated and fold cross validation. So that was millions of models over tens of, tens of thousands of, of state of the art uh, analysis setups. And the reason I'm emphasizing this so strongly is because that's the only way to really find out if something works across the board, when it fails, when it works, uh, doesn't work better than others, and, and so forth. Um, it's a very important element, I think, that, that's not emphasized so. so so let's see now about the the R and D process part. Very important insight for me is to build upon a firm theoretical foundation. Uh, the reason is because uh, it tells you where to look intensely, what, where to not look at, what expectations you may have, and also to capitalize on on the. Solidly by the work done by others and to build upon it rather than discard it and start from scratch. So, very, very important to have a solid theoretical foundation. Uh, in medicine, there is a whole hierarchy of evidence of studies that, um, that goes from, uh, from animal research to case studies with humans to um, corporate studies. Uh, case control science, the randomized control science, the method analysis, and so forth. So it progresses systematically from obs observations and, and low level experiments all the way to the, uh, the healthcare. And I think that similarly for data science, analytics, and computational product discovery, we should have a similar hierarchy of evidence that goes from the problem definition and the theory and the description of algorithms and, and their theoretical properties on paper and their experimentation with uh, limited data sets where we know the true answer, and real data sets where we know the true answer, all the way to real data sets where we don't know the, the, the true answer. There's this hierarchy of evidence there too, and we, I think, from my perspective, this is a great, great tool for developing techniques that work in real life. Um, another insight is um, whether, what's the motivation for a method? Is the motivation that I want to create a method that has my name? Is the motivation I want to create a method that operates with a certain principle I like? Or is the motivation that I want to solve a problem that cannot be solved currently? And I think that if my motivation is to solve a problem that cannot be solved currently, my chances of making more impact are higher. And in order to find out whether a, uh, this problem does not have a solution or whether the existing solutions are not good enough, we need a lot of benchmarking. We need a lot of thorough, realistic, unbiased to the extent possible uh, benchmarking. <coughs> and for me, the characteristics of, of, of good benchmarking is to have extensive testing, which means a lot of data sets, sample sizes, variety of noise conditions, missing, missingness, and, and a number of other factors that may affect performance. To try also to systematically make the algorithm break, to find out what are the conditions that it breaks. To respect the author setups and protocols, so, for example, if an author publishes an algorithm and says, okay, here's how to run it, here's how I run it, here's how I set it up, when you compare it, your algorithm to that, just do it as they say, okay? There's a reason why they say it the way they say it, and, and, and you cannot prove that you're unbiased if you, if you tweak it differently. I mean, at the minimum, I think we should do it like the original author says, and if we want to do additional, uh, we should add the additional. Um, so, all parameterization is very important. Otherwise, become an exercise in overfitting the magical parameters to the magical value. Um, looking at the overall robustness, uh, not just uh, the average or, or the performance or, or special case performance, but looking at the robustness across various problems, data sets, and so forth. One thing that I learned is to be more respectful than I ever was about naive algorithms. So I would laugh at algorithms. say, oh, this is a stupid algorithm, because it's so naive, ho, ho, ho. Um, and, and you can feel good for five minutes doing that, but then you test those things and you're like, my goodness, this thing does work when special conditions X, Y, Z. And it works better than my super duper uh, smart one. So I'm not so smart as I thought initially. You know, so, so I think we can approach this from a perspective of, of humbleness, also an open mind, uh, because there are always circumstances that would make even the stupidest algorithm really, really work well. And we didn't need to find what are these conditions. Um, Okay, the other thing is the real life workflow. 
That's very, very important. Because um, real life research, I mean, our, our purpose is to construct algorithms that will allow uh, real life scientists do their real life science better, right? So we need really to find out what is their workflow. So if you talk to molecular biologists, they don't want to find the, the exact precise pathway. If you give them a good uh, two or three targets that they don't know about, they have not noticed before, they will be grateful and they will spend their next 10 years going after that. Right? So an algorithm then that does not as, uh, aspire to learn the exact full pathway in one experiment, which was completely unrealistic, by the way, but rather gives 10 good targets to the biologist, that will be a huge success in real life. Therefore, that informed a little bit of our thinking. So instead of trying to find the perfect you know, pathway right on from the one round of the algorithm, we said, OK, why don't we find a, a decent local neighborhood? Then if it has 10 elements, the biologists will sort, it, sort them out very quickly. Okay? Even if half of them are false positives, it doesn't matter. It's going to be uh, uh, very valuable. And some other things make things harder. For example, I mentioned the manipulation problem previously. Uh, in certain domains, for example, in marketing, you can do simultaneous manipulations easily of many variables. Uh, you cannot do that in molecular biology, for example. You cannot do it with humans easily. You cannot, uh, you don't have super specific manipulations in molecular biology. You may think you are uh, silencing uh, that particular uh, uh, gene, but it's not specific and it silences another, you know, 10. And, and this non specificity really screws up all the assumptions of the algorithm. So uh, you need to, we need to study the workflow of actual real life discovery in order to design the algorithms to address these workflow needs. Um, oh, the other thing is sometimes an algorithmic idea may look like it will not or should not work. But that does not mean it will not work. Okay, And for many years, I was convinced that all the empirical results of, of Hiton and MQB and uh, et cetera uh, were somehow wrong. And the reason was because there was nothing in the algorithms that we had put in to address the multiple hypothesis testing problem. So you were having algorithms that would conduct hundreds of thousands of conditional dependence tests without having an explicit corrective mechanism in the algorithm. So my knowledge of statistics were telling me that this algorithm should not work, basically. But it works, and here's why. It works because there is inherent self-limiting behavior of these algorithms to false positives due to conditional dependence testing. And you can see the details in the MLR 2010 Part B, or to see exactly you know, how this happens and how strong it is. It's extremely strong, by the way. You feed 1,000 irrelevant variables to the local causal uh, neighborhood discovery algorithm, and it outputs four false positives out of 1,000 irrelevant ones, which means it's much stronger than your regular uh, full discovery control techniques. Um, uh, I mentioned previously why piecing together things would work and, and why would that ever be better than the PC skeletal phase. Uh, learning with empty states is another classic one. People say, oh, OK, if you have an XOR function, you, you're never going to learn with this algorithm because they, they, they they require faithfulness. If you don't have a univariate association, it will never end up being in the, in the tentative local neighborhood. The false negative, you get the DM to say. Well, fine. In worst case scenario, that's exactly what happens. In real life, it's not. Here's why. Because take the XOR example. If you have unbalanced distribution of the XOR parents or the parity function parents, there are uh, non zero univariate effects, first order effects. So they get picked up by the algorithm. They are connected through other paths in a larger network, same way. The first order effects are non zero, they're, they're getting picked up. Um, you have case control designs uh, that create a similar effect, they're being picked up. So you see, the worst case uh, theoretical uh, bootyman, if you allow the expression, does not happen in real life uh, very often. That's why you have so many simple techniques, as a matter of fact, like your universal association, simple regression, and so forth that have been proven to be so powerful across so many domains for so many years. There are mitigating effects, as a matter of fact, that allow for high performance of even very simple and naive techniques. Um, OK, so I'm not going to go any more about this because we're running out of time. Some other insights as a lot of people produce techniques and say, oh, OK, so I fix, if I fix the parameter of my technique, 
then the output is fantastic, but they do not tell you how to fix this parameter. There is no clear way how to fix the parameter. And if you're